I first gave this series of cases in a webinar that was sponsored by the ASHNR and the ESHNR. I got to share the stage with Dr. Jan Castleman. I'll put the link to the full webinar in the notes uh, in case you want to see the, the full thing. As we've just learned, when you encounter a lesion in the suprahyoid neck, your differential diagnosis is highly dependent on this one object, the parapharyngeal fat, and how that parapharyngeal fat is displaced by the lesion. Let's start with the masticator space. When a lesion arises in the masticator space, you expect it to displace the parapharyngeal fat posteriorly and a little bit medially. The most common lesions that we encounter in the masticator space are infections, particularly odontogenic abscesses, and tumors. There are many different types of tumors. Metastases are quite common. Here's an example of a mass arising within the masticator space. You can see how it is pushing on the parapharyngeal fat posteromedially. This has a very mass-like appearance, but it turned out to be a chronic infection. This is a more classic appearance to an abscess in the masticator space. Again, you can see how it's displacing that parapharyngeal fat posteromedially. When you see an infection in this masticator space, the most likely culprit is going to be the teeth, like this periapical abscess. You can see this break in the cortex through which the infection has spread into the masticator space. The other major category of disease that we see in the masticator space is tumors. For example, this large mass, again, look how it is pushing that parapharyngeal fat posteriorly and medially. This happens to be a mass that arose from the muscles of mastication. It's a malignant solitary fibrous tumor, which is an unusual histology. Here's another mass in the masticator space. Look how it is compressing the parapharyngeal fat, pushing it posteriorly and medially. We're in the masticator space. This time we're within the muscle. And although there's nothing about this mass that will clearly tell you what kind of tumor it is on the axial images, let me show you a coronal image. Uh, now we have a clue. You can see that this tumor is knuckling up through foramen ovale and then spreading down into the infratemporal fossa. This is a schwannoma arising from V3. Here's another more aggressive looking mass arising within the masticator space. It is pushing on the parapharyngeal fat, predominantly medially, a little bit posteriorly. This lesion is obviously arising from the jaw itself. This turns out to be a Ewing sarcoma, you might have guessed, from this hair on end or starburst pattern of bone. Here is another example of a tumor arising in the masticator space, pushing the parapharyngeal fat medially and posteriorly. This is a tumor arising from the mandible itself, a mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the mandible itself, a relatively unusual histology for that location. Here's another mass of the masticator space. Look how the parapharyngeal fat has been displaced medially and a little bit posteriorly. Also note the destruction of the jaw itself. That's another good clue. This is a metastasis. It happens to be hepatocellular carcinoma, but of course any metastasis could have a similar appearance. Let's move on now to the lateral pharyngeal space. Lesions that arise in this location will push the parapharyngeal fat laterally and posteriorly, predominantly laterally, a little bit posteriorly. The sorts of lesions that arise in this location include infections, we'll particularly talk about peritonsillar abscess, and tumors, the two big tumors here, squamous cell carcinoma and lymphoma. The first thing we want to consider in the lateral pharyngeal space is infection, and this is a classic appearance. Here is the mass with predominantly low density centrally and a rim of enhancement. Look what it's doing to the parapharyngeal fat. It's pushing it out laterally, maybe a little bit posteriorly. Also, notice its relationship to the tonsil, the palatine tonsil itself. It is deep to that palatine tonsil in between the tonsil and the parapharyngeal fat. This is the potential space, the peritonsillar 
space, and this is where peritonsillar abscesses arise. Let's delve into this concept a little deeper. When we see an acute tonsillitis, it has a characteristic enhancement pattern on CT. It has this serpentine or tiger stripe pattern within the palatine tonsil itself, representing the mucosa going in and out of the tonsillar crypts. It is only later after that acute tonsillitis has resolved that we tend to see complications such as peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar abscess arises adjacent to the tonsil itself, deep to the tonsil itself, between the tonsil and the now displaced peripharyngeal fat. Once again, this peripharyngeal fat being displaced predominantly laterally because we are rising in the lateral pharyngeal space. If infections in this lateral pharyngeal space escape that peritonsillar space and encroach into the peripharyngeal fat, then they can escape into all sorts of surrounding spaces. You'll notice that the peripharyngeal fat here has been completely replaced by this infection as it spreads out laterally. Here's an image of that self-same patient uh, about a year later, and you can see how that infected peripharyngeal fat has scarred down, and we've lost our marker for superhyoid masses. Here's an example of a tumor arising in the peripharyngeal space. This looks a lot like that infection, heterogeneous enhancement, a little bit deep within the tonsillar pillar. Notice again how we are pushing our peripharyngeal fat out laterally, maybe a little bit posteriorly. This heterogeneous enhancement pattern within a tumor is characteristic of squamous cell carcinoma, which is by far the most common tumor to arise within this lateral pharyngeal space. Here's another example of squamous cell carcinoma arising within the tonsillar pillar. Note the relationship to the peripharyngeal fat. We're pushing the peripharyngeal fat out laterally. This is another heterogeneously enhancing mass within the palatine tonsil itself, not deep to the palatine tonsil, within the palatine tonsil. This is another squamous cell carcinoma. This mass in the lateral pharyngeal space looks a little bit different. It's more uniformly enhancing. It still has the same relationship to the peripharyngeal fat. It's still pushing it out laterally. It's still in the lateral pharyngeal space, but this is a more uniformly enhancing tumor, and that is perhaps a clue that we are in fact dealing with lymphoma, the second most common tumor to arise in the lateral pharyngeal space, rather than squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another example of a lymphoma in the lateral pharyngeal space, again emphasizing the uniform enhancement that can sometimes be a clue for us that we're not dealing with squamous cell carcinoma. Again, the relationship to the peripharyngeal fat, it's pushing it out laterally. And now here is a tricky case. This is a uniformly enhancing mass within the tonsil itself. But this is squamous cell carcinoma. It's important to remember that an uncommon presentation of a common disease is gonna be more common than the characteristic appearance of an uncommon disease. Squamous cell carcinoma just has to be on your differential when you're dealing with a tumor in the lateral pharyngeal space. Even if it looks like a lymphoma, you really need to consider that it's an uncharacteristic look to a squamous cell carcinoma because squamous cell carcinomas are so much more common. Okay, let's continue on now and discuss the retropharyngeal space. Masses that arise within the retropharyngeal space will displace the peripharyngeal fat predominantly laterally and a little bit anteriorly. Retropharyngeal space lesions include infections such as suppurative adenitis or uh, retropharyngeal abscess and tumors. There are lymph nodes in the retropharyngeal space and so metastatic disease to these lymph nodes will produce masses in the retropharyngeal space. 
Here's an example of a mass arising in the retropharyngeal space. It is displacing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly anteriorly and a little bit laterally. If you looked carefully, you probably noticed that there was a smaller one on the other side. This is metastatic disease. Now, nasopharyngeal carcinoma famously produces retropharyngeal lymphadenopathy about half the time. Uh, but the other lesions, other uh, primary tumors, can produce metastases. This happens to be an example of breast cancer, but retropharyngeal lymph nodes from nasopharyngeal carcinoma could look quite similar. Another way to get enlarged lymph nodes in the retropharyngeal space is reactive lymphadenopathy. This is a child with an acute tonsillitis, and you can see that there are reactive enlarged lymph nodes in the retropharyngeal space bilaterally. Notice how we are pushing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly anteriorly and a little bit laterally, benign reactive nodes in a child. I don't think anyone's going to be fooled by a lipoma in the retropharyngeal space because it has an expected low density on CT. Maybe if you saw this on a non-fat suppressed post-contrast MRI, it might be a little more confusing. But um, uh, just for completeness, uh, a lipoma arising in the retropharyngeal space. Sometimes the lymph nodes get overwhelmed by the infection and they form an abscess. This is called suppurative adenitis or suppurative adenopathy, and it is seen almost exclusively in children. So here is a low density mass with rim enhancement right where we'd expect a retropharyngeal lymph node elevating this parapharyngeal fat predominantly anteriorly and a little bit laterally. If the infection escapes the lymph nodes and starts spreading through the retropharyngeal space, we get a retropharyngeal abscess. Notice that it is displacing the uh, parapharyngeal fat predominantly anteriorly and a little bit laterally. And in fact, you can see that there is some phlegmon that's even involving that fat. This is a really important counterexample to that retropharyngeal abscess. This is a retropharyngeal phlegmon. There is no discrete pus here, just infected endematous uh, soft tissue within the retropharyngeal space. One of the most important things that we are called upon to do in deep space infections of the neck is to distinguish between abscess and phlegmon, and the retropharyngeal space is a famous location to do this. So let's compare the abscess and the phlegmon in the retropharyngeal space. The retropharyngeal abscess has a rim of enhancement around each of its pockets, a complete rim of enhancement. The retropharyngeal phlegmon may have a displaced vessel with a little bit of enhancement, but there is no complete rim of enhancement. Sometimes abscesses have a small amount of gas, especially if they are an anaerobic infection. We do not expect to see gas when we're dealing with a phlegmon. The most important distinguishing characteristic, in my opinion, is that abscesses form a spherical configuration, whereas phlegmon conforms to the underlying configuration of the retropharyngeal space. So if you see this longitudinally oriented bowtie-like configuration or rectangular configuration that reflects the normal configuration of the retropharyngeal space, you are more likely to be dealing with a phlegmon. If you're seeing something more spherical, you are more likely to be dealing with an abscess. Very important distinction to make. This is surgical disease. This is not surgical disease. This is another really important alternative to retropharyngeal abscess. This does not have the signs of retropharyngeal abscess. It's just displaced vessels, no complete enhancing rim, no gas. It's not particularly dark in, uh, in its CT density. And importantly, it has retained the normal configuration of the retropharyngeal space. This isn't even an infection. This is just an effusion. What caused this effusion? This is a longest coli tendinitis as evidenced by calcification at the insertion along the anterior arch of C1. Longest coli tendinitis, don't confuse that with an abscess, don't send that patient to surgery. What they need are to take two aspirin and call you in the morning.
For the sake of completeness, I think it's worth noting that sometimes you get hemorrhage into the retropharyngeal space and it forms a hematoma. You can identify this hematoma because it's got that rectangular or bow tie configuration right where you expect the retropharyngeal space to be, but it's hyper dense as you'd expect an acute hematoma to be. Let's move on now and talk about the post-styloid parapharyngeal space. Masses that arise in the post-styloid parapharyngeal space should displace the parapharyngeal fat anteriorly and a little bit medially. Now, some people prefer to refer to this as the carotid space. I like the more descriptive term post-styloid space because it tells me where to look for it. Some people like carotid space because it tells you what's in there. Our differential for the post space includes things that arise from vessels, such as pseudoaneurysms, and things that arise from nerves, such as nerve sheaths, tumors, or paragangliomas. We are just going to touch on this because in a future webinar, you're going to get a complete lecture on the post parapharyngeal space. So let me just show you some quick examples and we'll move on. Here's an example of a pseudoaneurysm. How do I know that this is a pseudoaneurysm? Look how it's displacing the parapharyngeal fat. The parapharyngeal fat is predominantly anteriorly and a little bit medially. Remember the retropharyngeal space was going to push this a little bit laterally. The fact that it's a little bit medial tells us that it came from the post parapharyngeal fat. Also, there's no carotid artery here. This is all just one big pseudoaneurysm. Here's an example of a nerve sheath tumor. This one happens to be a neurofibroma. Once again, look how it is displacing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly anteriorly and a little bit medially. This is a post-styloid mass. Okay, moving on. Our last space in, uh, as we go around the circle here is the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. Masses that arise in the pre-styloid space displace the parapharyngeal fat predominantly medially and maybe a little bit anteriorly, but predominantly medially. Masses that arise in this location have arisen from the deep lobe of the parotid. That's what normally lives here, the deep lobe of the parotid, and that's why some people prefer to refer to this as the parotid space. I like the more descriptive term pre-styloid space because it tells me where to find it right in front of the styloid. So the normal anatomy of the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space is that it contains the deep lobe of the parotid. Thus, we expect salivary neoplasms to be the lesions that we find in this location. Statistically, pleomorphic adenoma is going to be the most common, even more common than masses that arise in the superficial lobe. This is a classic image of a pre-styloid parapharyngeal mass. This is actually an image from a head CT. It's an incidental finding. Um, here's the styloid process right in front of it. That's our pre-styloid space. And you can see that it is displacing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly medially if the relationship to the styloid was not enough to convince you. This is, in fact, a pleomorphic adenoma of the deep lobe of the parotid. Here's another example on MRI now. This mass is displacing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly medially, maybe a little bit anteriorly, predominantly medially. And it is arising off of the deep lobe of the parotid, another example of a pleomorphic adenoma. On MRI, one of the important aspects that allows us to nail down the diagnosis of pleomorphic adenoma is T2 signal. If you happen to catch a pleomorphic adenoma whose T2 signal is brighter than CSF, you can be confident in that diagnosis. It's one of the specific findings of a pleomorphic adenoma is it's extremely bright. T2 signal. Not all pleomorphic adenomas have this. It's not a sensitive sign, but when you are lucky enough to see it, you can be confident in your diagnosis. It's a specific sign. Now you can really tell that this is a pre-styloid mass because you can see it being indented by the styloid process right there. And in fact, this mass is knuckling out between that styloid process and the ramus of the mandible. So I get to use one of my favorite uh, phrases, stylomandibular tunnel. This is a mass extending from the deep lobe through that stylomandibular tunnel.
Here's another example where you don't even need to see the displacement of the parapharyngeal fat because the relationship of the styloid will convince you that this is a pre-styloid mass. Here is the styloid process indenting the posterior surface of this uniformly enhancing mass. It's in the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. It's another pleomorphic adenoma. Sadly, not everything that arises in the prestyloid parapharyngeal space is benign. This happens to be an adenoid cystic carcinoma arising in the prestyloid space. You can see how it's displacing the parapharyngeal fat predominantly medially, but you can also see how it is traveling along the mandibular nerve into the mandibular foramen. Uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma is, of course, famous for their perineural spread. So we've talked about all the different spaces that surround the parapharyngeal fat, but is it ever possible to get a lesion that's arising within the parapharyngeal fat itself? It is possible, and it's a very limited differential when you see that. The only things that we see inside, within the parapharyngeal fat, are branchial cleft cysts and pleomorphic adenomas, and I'll show you how those arise. So here's a large mass with surprisingly uniform signal in the suprahyoid neck. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to search for that parapharyngeal fat and see how it's been displaced. But we can't find it. The parapharyngeal fat is missing. It's been completely replaced by this mass. When you see complete replacement of the parapharyngeal fat, you're dealing with one of two lesions, and this uniform signal clues us in that it's a branchial cleft cyst. Remember that the second branchial cleft arises within the palatine tonsil, runs through the parapharyngeal fat, and then comes down to the neck to its more familiar location along the antero, anterior aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The second most common location for a second branchial cleft cyst is here inside the parapharyngeal fat. Okay, here's another suprahyoid mass. What's its relationship to the parapharyngeal fat? How's it displacing it? Well, wait a minute, there's fat all the way around this mass. This mass is encased within the parapharyngeal fat. It is arising within the fat, and it's lobular in its configuration. This is a pleomorphic adenoma that arose from salivary rests, not from the deep lobe of the parotid itself. Notice that you can see a complete cleft of fat separating this mass from the deep lobe of the parotid. That's why it's not displacing the parapharyngeal fat. It's replacing, arising within the parapharyngeal fat. But be careful. This mass looks a lot like the last one in that it is, has a fat all the way around it. But here, there is no cleft separating this mass from the deep lobe of the parotid. This is an exophytic pleomorphic adenoma that's extending out. It's important to distinguish an exophytic pleomorphic adenoma from an independently arising pleomorphic adenoma because of the effect of the surgery on the facial nerve. Are there any other spaces that we need to be concerned about in the suprahyoid neck? Well, for the sake of completeness, let me mention just a couple more. This mass is arising outside of the platysma muscle. You can see the platysma muscle coming down like this, and this is superficial to the platysma muscle. Well, remember that the superficial cervical fascia contains the platysma muscle. This is super, so superficial, it's outside the superficial cervical fascia. This is subcutaneous. This is a subcutaneous abscess, and this can occur from infections of the skin itself. Even acne can be overwhelmed and, and form an abscess like this. Remember that the carotid space extends down below the level of the hyoid, so sometimes infrahyoid masses will arise within the carotid space, uh, like this vagal schwannoma that's displacing the artery and vein anteriorly. So that was a whirlwind tour of some of the most common lesions to affect the parapharyngeal spaces. The key, of course, in narrowing your differential is figuring out in which direction the parapharyngeal fat has been displaced and figuring out which of those parapharyngeal spaces gave rise to the lesion.